Welcome to another episode of the Create Your Vibrant Life podcast. Today, I have a dynamic, dynamic person on my podcast, Laylee. Laylee, how do you say your last name again? I should have asked you before the podcast started. No worries. Naruz Knutson. Beautiful. Naruz Knutson. And we'll have all the show notes connecting you, you. Um, with, our, with the audience. So I am so delighted to have you here. And because you speak to, you speak my love language, which is wellness with your people. And um, so I want to just get started by having you introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about what you do and who you are. Thank you so much. And it's such an honor to, to be on this podcast with you as someone who's been on the other end of listening um, to the wisdom that you share and all of the, you know, much needed information that I think whether someone's in the wellness world or just in whatever field you're in is it's such a good reminder for all of us to, to remember uh, to just be in an alignment um, with who we are. And just with that being said, a little bit about my background, I am the co-founder and managing director of the Breathe Institute, which is a uh, really kind of a interdisciplinary practice focused on all things, uh, airway, better breathing, better sleeping. Um, and I have the great fortune of supporting a myriad of different uh, providers. So we have, I believe, uh, it's either six or eight physicians. We have uh, six orofacial myofunctional therapists, physical therapists, yoga nidra, psychology, um, uh, integrative uh, pharmacy to bring in both the homeopathic and traditional pain management for our surgical patients, all the way to community leaders and builders, really bringing the message of overall wellness together. So our main headquarters is in Westwood Village in Los Angeles. Uh, we have our uh, Breathe Institute and our Breathe Babies and Kids offices there, as well as a satellite location. Um, in Walnut Creek and San Diego and an office in Malibu Canyon, Calabasas. So very fortunate to do the work that I do. And I lead uh, the team really in the day-to-day -day operations. Yeah, and I can't wait to dive in about leadership and how you bring this quality to your all your leaders. But I also wanted to say that I'm also a recipient of the Breathe Institute through two ways. One is through Dr. Rati Handa, who introduced us, and she's been such an integral part of our the well-being of our family. And both my kids had their tongue tie done at the Breathe Institute. So we are eternally grateful for being recipients of the work that you're doing. And it's so amazing that you found it. So tell us a little bit about how you came to finding, finding, found, being yeah. a founder of the Breathe Institute. I love that question because it really highlights um, the core message that you teach day in and day out, whether it's through your podcast, your individual work with professionals, but it really comes down to listening to your gut and being in alignment with your higher self, if you will, kind of like the whole stoic uh, concept or Christ Christianity consciousness, whatever you want to call it, because uh, my background goes back to higher education nonprofit. So I graduated UCLA and went to work back at UCLA and their development alumni relations uh, uh, unit where we really helped convey the message of the state, barely supporting the school and the need that was there to be, be, be able to keep the university at a high caliber, whether it was through recruiting high end faculty, being competitive with Ivy Leagues to bring the, you know, these uh, uh, phenomenal faculty members over, I believe at that time, UCLA had the most Nobel Prize winning professors. So those were the things that we would do in order to, to convey these points to our alumni and share the message of need. So uh, I really learned almost everything I did from a business operations communication uh, perspective in my decade plus in development, both at San Diego State University and UCLA, because it comes down to people. It comes down to honoring your people, knowing the, the brain trust that's needed to be able to succeed in any organization and knowing that everybody's uniquely different. And the message and the ask for the, the, the librarians that graduated UCLA could be very different than that that we sent to the School of Law. So with that, at a very young age, I was a teenager when I started um, 
um, at the UCLA call center. And as someone who did the calls too, and started, you know, with uh, in, in that role and position, you learn to listen. So the art of active listening comes in through, through, through that experience. Then you learn to start recognizing people's talents in terms of who is nervous to get on the phone, who's great at writing the script and coming up with the the strategies of what the ask levels are, you really see the power of the brain trust and this kind of uh, team come together. And so I really attribute a lot of my success uh, from a business perspective to, to the lessons I learned in that world. Now, fast forward to 2009, I was at UCLA Anderson and it was one of the top schools and still remains one of the top business schools in the nation, but it was big on entrepreneurism. And I was in the dean, the associate dean's office at the time, and we were trying to reach out to a few more alumni who, um, it was during a reunion class gift campaign, and I had a few um, uh, prospects, if you will, who we were still reaching out to. And I remember Al Osborne, he's a brilliant, beautiful soul. If anybody uh, has the time, I would love for him to be a guest on your show and podcast, but he, I remember, just picked up the phone and called a few of these uh, prospects. And I think he got like a million dollars in pledges just off of the few conversations he had. And here I am in my twenties, just sitting back and observing and saying, wow, first and foremost, how can people afford to give so generously? That's amazing. Secondly, how much trust there was in that communication and that call and that conversation and that exchange between uh, um, you know, Al and the the person on the line. And I remember that moment was one of the pivotal moments in my life where I looked at him and I said, you know, how can, how come they can give so generously and why do they do it? And it was all about the legacy. It was about, you know, giving back, paying it forward, uh, being able to, to bestow that to somebody else, you know, the same kind of fortune they had. And it was that, that kind of lesson that then, uh, catapulted me into uh, becoming a consultant. And in 2009, I answered an ad and it was an airway professional. He was a dentist who was, and still remains very forward thinking, uh, was looking at all things TMD and sleep apnea and wanted to find an operations marketing person uh, to help kind of um, market and support his TMD airway practice. And I know this is getting long-winded, but it's a fun no, story. No, it's perfect. Okay. Great. Talk. Perfect. Keep talking. So um, I, that's where I met Sonda Valku Pinkerton, who was the orofacial myofunctional therapist and the hygienist there. And, you know, we delved into all things research. We are, you know, lifelong learners. So as Sonda started learning myofunctional therapy, I was learning alongside her. And then we stumbled upon this uh, literature, the, the, the best research that came out in 2015 that actually supported the field of orofacial myofunctional therapy. And of course, Dr. Suresh Zaghi was one of the authors on that article. So this is prior to us feeding him. Uh, I printed out a bunch of copies. Sonda would do lunch and learns, go to doctor's offices and say, there's validity to this you know, modality and it really helps your apnea patients by 50% in adults, 62% in children improve their apnea hypopnea score, or just their overall sleep disordered breathing by just adding this adjunct therapy and treatment. And it was simple as, as simple as what you do, working out every other muscle in your body. We neglect the you know, muscles in our orofacial complex in our head and neck. So it's teaching simple exercises that um, help patients get their tongue up to the roof of the spot if that's you know a healthy position for them and um, be able to have more mobility, more range of motion, speak more clearly, eat you know uh, uh, different textured foods. So we uh, stumbled upon the research and then uh, the universe does what the universe does best and aligns you right asking you shall receive and aligns you with the people that you need to get to that desired goal that whether or not we know, it's the goal then in that time, right? Um, ends up, you know, looking now six, seven years down the line and looking back at all these events that I'm sharing with you guys, it, it had to be orchestrated or manifested to some extent, right? So lo and behold, Sonda goes to a conference and Joy Moeller, who's been a pioneer and a pivotal figure in this field, comes down and says, what about myofunctional therapy? The speaker says, what, you know, what, what's that? And of course, Sonda pulls out the research and says, I have it right here. And who's behind Sonda is Dr. Zaghi. And he looks over, he's like, let me look. Oh, I'm an author on that. 
And so he gives her the last business card. She comes into the office on Monday, hands it to me and says, baby bird, I met this phenomenal doctor. I call him. We all meet and fast forward and obviously lots of stories in between, but fast forward to the birth of the Breathe Institute. And of course, uh, I have to honor my husband and partner, Chad uh, Knudsen, who uh, came into the picture around 2012, 2013 as well and helped us with the entire art of storytelling, being able to brand all this, be able to build all this to a tangible uh, entity and a formation. So we opened our doors in 2017. And um, yeah, and going back to the original story, what started as a group of four or five of us, we're now about 60 of us and in five locations and so blessed to be able to do the work we do and to train other affiliate offices like Dr. Rati, who I'm so grateful for making this connection and for caring so much more about than just the mechanical side of, of being, you know, a dentist and a healer. She deep, dives deep into the, the spiritual as well. And I'm, I'm forever grateful for her making this connection. So long-winded answer to that story. But that's beautiful though, because it is preordained in some ways and you have to just open yourselves up to finding the, the cues, right? Like the cues all along and all you have to do is follow that path. And that's what you did. It's incredible. I think it's, I would have, so, and I know everything happened as it should, but had I had this, this wise kind of, I don't even know how to call you Padma. You have so many <laughs> gifts, but the ability for you to be able to see the people that you connect with and that you work with. And just last year, just the few conversations we had and the tidbits of the resources and the tips you gave me about just how I am. Um, I, I'll always remember just two things. One was when you talked about the invitation, right? And, and uh, you know, folks who have this gift of being able to see folks as talents and being able to help them get to that end goal, right? But at the same token, knowing that just because I and my role may be able to see that and say, you are so talented at this and have you ever thought about speaking or whatever it is, um, it, the invitation has to be there and the timing has to be right and the person has to be willing and ready. And I think just those little tidbits help so much, right? Because as you're building a business or managing a business, you don't think about what happens when it does succeed and it does scale. And then it gets so big to the point that you can't be as present day in and day out the way you were to help kind of instill this culture in the first place. So I think it's so helpful to have folks like you, resources like this podcast and, and all the different kind of um, services you offer to remind us as we get busier and busier and more and more successful to slow down, to recognize and to appreciate the things that are happening in the, in the interim. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lely. So I'm curious how obviously you grew for a reason, right? Like there were some things you did. And so you were following some of your intuitive guidance. So what helped you grow from 2017? It's not even that long. Like it's just so, so yeah. recent to such a high scale. Like you really scaled big. I, so what has helped? Beautiful question. I think it's, it's, we had this conversation with our Breathe Myo, our myofunctional therapy team, but I think it is like what you said when you talk about love language, it's finding people not that are, that are just like-minded, it's like-hearted and like, like, how would you say, have the same grit, like this insatiable thirst to just know more and to do better, right? So I, I attribute it all to the people, starting with the Sondas and the Dr. Zoggies, right? Because Chad and I are just the conduits that can help these brilliant providers who have the vision. I didn't go to medical school. I actually was pre-med UCLA. And after my second year, once I got into OCHEM, I was like, oh no, <laughs> this is not me, right? But, um, you know, it's it's being able to see a surgeon like Dr. Zoggy who tells anybody who comes along his way, whether you're a massage therapist or a physical therapist or a hygienist of speech path, tell me more. That's really interesting. Tell me more. How can I do better, right? This welcoming of information and not saying I'm Harvard, Stanford, UCLA, I know it all. That was one of the first uh, uh, integral parts of our success. His willingness to come out from as an ENT sleep surgeon into a dental office to meet with me and Sonda um, and to talk about what he does and how he can uh, improve what he does day in and day out. That was step number one. 
Then it takes the Sondas, these folks who never stop reading, who never stop searching, right? Just because she knew there were surgeons who did tongue ties, but the, they were coming back and patients were either getting a simple mucosal release or those who had tongue ties, but they weren't diagnosed as tongue ties because prior to Dr. Zaghi and us publishing our level three research, you know, tongue ties were defined and, and graded in a completely different way, right? So here's Sonda, who's this curious mind, who's like, we can do things better. And I'm not afraid to go out and, and pay more money to go to conferences and learn more and to question things and then bring this information and change our protocols. The folks that you see that do these continuing education courses, appreciate the providers that you have that keep going to these courses because it's not that they just take this information and learn it. They have to come back and their entire team has to change all of the protocols from the intakes to, to whatever they do day in and day out to make sure that this knowledge is actually implemented. So um, it takes the Sondas, it takes the Zoggies. And then this is where, you know, Chad and I could not have sustained the growth that we had if we didn't have the Jens and Mia. So I tell every doctor, make sure you have one clinical manager or, you know, director that can do everything clinically to support you, whether it's notes, sterilization, patient care, and then make sure you have an operational rock star. And that to me, it was Jen Rodriguez. And Jen, if anybody's seen Game of Thrones, I, I joke around and say she's all three dragons in one, right? Because she's not only just capable, but from day one, when she was hired, it would be like 536. And I'd be like, what are you still doing? Go home. And she'd be like, there's four more emails, or I'll do this once this is done. There was a sense of pride in the work that needed to be done. And that was the same thing with, um, uh, with Mia as well, Mia Jabara. And I'm so proud of Mia because she's now at Duke, the number one PA school in the nation. And what Mia instilled was that every medical assistant that ever joined the Breathe Institute after Mia, there was a bar, right? There was a bar. She was at USC when she uh, when she joined us. She was a, a senior. She graduated, became full time. She trained every medical assistant uh, uh, underneath her, and all of them have been total rock stars. So one last thing I'll share to that is every medical assistant that's ever supported Dr. Zaghi and our team, and there's ten who graduated on as alumni of the Breathe Institute. They're all in medical school, PA school, dental school. So it's probably the most rewarding part of our work is to be able to see the future of these healthcare providers coming in with the understanding of it, you treat the whole patient and it takes a whole team and a whole village to do it. That's incredible. So, so team effort and then embracing change, but you have a knack of hiring the right people. I think so it starts with just like the, what I mentioned, Mia and Jen, because at first when I did everything, I was with Sonda was in the back, Chad was at home making our videos, making our, our entire brand. And Sonda was, you know, assisting Dr. Zoggy. So her and I played almost every team role in the clinic for almost six months before we officially hired Jen and Mia. And I, I, I was so afraid because I was like, who's going to carry the day-to-day -day work the way I do? And I'm, I'm the owner. I'm one of the owners, right? But um, you know, when you find people who are passionate and genuinely take pride in the work they do, they're curious, they ask questions. When you're talking, they're listening because they want to learn how to talk like that. That's how I remember being when I was in my 20s. And, and um, I don't care if they have the experience or not, they're trainable. So we didn't look for people who specifically had experience running a medical practice and or an interdisciplinary team. I looked for people with grit and heart and who are willing to, to build the culture. And I think that instilled this, this expectation where even today, when we interview these younger students, the, the, the next generation of our lead medical assistants are like, what's up with the generation today? Do they not care? And I'm like, it's adorable. You're hearing a 22 year old, per, you know, a professional who's already been with us for three years, have a different expectation of what, what concierge care and it's true word or de definition means. Wow. That's incredible. Like the training. So, you, you know, you, you're also talking about honoring these people coming into your space and training them and keeping the standards really high. And this comes down to the team that we were talking about right before we started. Yeah. So what, what do you see is the quality of a leader that's going to help the team? I think it first and foremost comes with when it comes to healthcare, especially, and I know you're following 
is in a bunch of different um, industries and what have you. But when it comes specifically to healthcare, doctors went to school to be doctors. They spent a great deal of time in medical school and dental school, you know, if they're PTs, what OTs, what have you, getting the clinical knowledge and experience. They didn't go to business school to learn how to be inspirational and motivational. Some of them have that natural, uh, like look at Dr. Honda, right? She knew to seek out more uh, support for her team and to build the culture. Some of them naturally have that and others just need a point in the right direction. And Dr. Zaghi is someone who 100% supports all of these growth initiatives, but he's also someone who knows that he does best when he's in a clinical setting, when he's in the OR, he's operating, he's doing a comprehensive consultation for someone. So I think the first thing is an acceptance and truly knowing who you are. If you don't have these natural leadership abilities, identifying someone or hiring someone on your team who does, and then knowing how to keep watering their lawns, right? So whether it's doing team building retreats, whether it's you know, doing little things that honors them on their birthdays, their work anniversaries, whatever it is, that's that's very, very critical to the culture. But it's also remembering to 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 connect with themselves, even when they're not leading. Right. So even a surgeon or a doctor who's not leading and has a lady or a gen in their practice, how do you bring about trainings like EOS or working with Padma Ali to make sure that the team is in alignment with what they do best, right? And the last thing I'll say to that is I've been a firm believer that SWOT analysis, the whole strength, weakness, opportunities, threats, if something's a threat to someone on your team, pull that off their job description. If they don't naturally get like just excited on a high by what the work or the project, the scope of work is, then that's not their work. Because if you do a quick personality test, like a Myers-Briggs or 16 personalities, and you have those analysts and the folks that love metrics and reports, let them do all the analytical stuff. Don't ask an entirely right brain person who cringes at the thought of Excel to do your reporting for you, right? So it's know your people, know yourself, work on yourself, even if it's once a quarter, Go on a little retreat, go, you know, seek coaching or whatever it is to remember how important these factors are. Yeah. And you, you, you advocate for that in all your presentations and all that, right? I've 100%. seen you do that. Yeah. And this yeah. is where I, I, I bless Dr. Zaghi because he's not like, hey, I have a four day course and I want every hour of it to be folks listening to me. He always wants the, the participants and the audience to understand it is a village. That's why you hear from our orofacial myofunctional therapists. You hear from everybody who pay, plays an integral part in our team. And we typically close those courses with Jen, Rose, and myself. And I haven't even mentioned Rose, but Rose, um, I'm so fortunate. And you told me to always carry Rose with me, if you remember whether it was the oil. And Rose, I was privileged um, uh, because she's one of Jen's best friends from you know, childhood and beyond, beyond, and she joined our team and is helping me operationally. She's the associate director of the Institute. And, um, you know, from, from the educational perspective, Jen Rose and I come on and we talk about the, these critical parts of know your team, do personality assessments. Are you happy in your day-to-day uh, -day work? And if not, what, what's needed to get you there? And we don't have the tools. We're just there to ask the questions so they can remember that this is a part of the success factor. And this is where I feel like our extended village, right? Providers like you who offer the services you do. Cassandra Carlopio, who's a psychologist who does mindfulness and, and yoga nidra for our patients who are stuck in fight or flight, right? Their autonomic nervous system needs some support. That's not, it's not a structural thing anymore. We've cleared them surgically, right? So it's not that everything we do stops with the, the structural stuff that we offer. There's a functional side that we offer as well. And then there's the mindful and the awareness side that really comes through providers like you, who, um, you know, I just wish were part of mainstream medicine. Um, it's such a critical part of healing and, and just even the wound healing aspect of the surgeries we do. 
Right, right. It does. It's like approaching it from a very holistic viewpoint, right? And, you know, one of the first things I remember you and I talking like long time ago was about know thyself. Like Mm -hmm. that, that is a big part of your presentation, like not just even with your students, but like even when you go outside and do, right? And you're promoting that on a larger scale, which is so amazing lately. Like it's, it's really incredible to have people like you advocating for people to know themselves because that's where it all starts, when you don't know yourself, you're literally blundering around in the darkness, right? But when you know yourself, then you can bring that light into the world and know exactly how you can serve. It's beautiful. It's something we don't have time for these days. And that's a limiting belief and a statement in itself, right? It's not that we don't have time, we don't carve out time for. And that's what I love about the tools that you gave me in the session I had with you. And it just, even like, you're like with someone with your work schedule and as busy as you are, you may not be able to go off an hour lunch break and and be able to, to, to decompress, but find a quiet spot for 10, 15 minutes and just lay down flat and just re-energize and, and uh, kind of reboot. And that little tip, that one little tip, you wouldn't believe how many different crazy times it's gotten me through. And I think, you know, when we even talk about heal thyself, our courses have evolved to the point where our in-person courses now beyond just all the didactic from eight to five, every evening we have a session that is, whether it's somatic healing, we had Dr. Christian Gonzalez, who I think I've been trying to connect the two of you as well. Um, He's a big advocate of, um, you know, of, of healing thyself, knowing thyself and knowing what we ingest, what we say, all of these things and how it has an impact on our day-to-day health and well-being, and really why the work that you guys do is just as important as being able to surgically, you know, free up someone's tongue to be able to talk, swallow, breathe, what have you, is um, how do they feel about it? And I'm going to give Dr. Arati another shout out because she was at our office doing her affiliate proctorship. And I remember she asked Dr. Zoggy, she goes, Dr. Zoggy, you're masterful at what you do. And you've probably done thousands of these. But what happens is I don't think you realize the transformation and the gift you've just left this individual with. Right. And, and taking a second to even ask, like, what are you going to do with this new freedom? What are you going to do with all this new mobility? So what she has integrated in her take home post-op care package is a little journal uh, with their logo, which is brilliant from a business perspective. Right. But it's a little journal with their logo. And as a patient, she asks you to journal what you're feeling, especially the first week or two, as your body's going through all these changes and adapting through all these changes. So there's so much more we can do to continue to improve health uh, care as a whole. And I think a big part of that is putting um, just resources and, and, and visionaries and, and uh, folks like you at the center of, of it. And even starting a medical school, dental school, having all of these future providers kind of go through these activities and, and become better aligned with themselves. Yeah, and it takes radical thinkers like you and Dr. Zaghi to even start these things, right? And to well, think outside the cool. box. It's like we showed the model, right? Because so many folks have, we're not the first to do this. There's a, there's a lot of folks who work in a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary fashion. We weren't the first to do tongue ties. There are so many people that came before us that we are building upon the, the foundational steps that others have left before us. I think we were the first to show how you can really do this in a cohesive fashion of 50 plus people coming together and tribing together to show that true healing comes not in a silo, not when you operate in silos, but when you have this comprehensive viewpoint and the person at the head isn't just, nope, I, my view as a surgeon trumps everything you say, therapist. He's like, huh, therapist, thanks to you guys, we're now exploring the role of lip ties in a greater way, right? And that's that's active listening, it's respect, and it's it's understanding that each one of us has talents that benefits the whole, especially when it comes to, to, to treating a patient, right? Yeah. And Dr. Rati is a great example of that, right? Like that's 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 her speciality. Like she's really integrated the deeper healing, not just on the on the physical level. Absolutely. And she's She's the perfect role model example of how do you integrate the work that you do by having her team go through the training and getting the team better alignment, like in better alignment with where they should be. They pivoted their roles. That's exactly what every practice should be doing. We do this every single year and our team, God bless them. They are so adaptable to change by now. Sometimes we flip things upside down and completely change things, but it's all in, in, in the hopes of getting them to where 
they will thrive. You know, it's not a, for me, I don't look at it as a job. I never call, ask my team. It's never like I get on the phone and say, you know, my, my, I don't use the word staff. I say team. Um, I don't use the word boss, right? I, I get on the phone. I say my colleague, um, you know, and it could be a brand new assistant that we just hired. My colleague just informed me that, and it's not that there aren't hierarchies in business. I fully get that. But when you empower people to be the best version of who they came to, to be in your uh, kind of organization, then, then you take away all that hierarchy and you take all that away and you just focus on watering their lawns, growing, growing them and making them the most capable support team because I could not have gotten to where we are today without having the entire support of our operations and clinical team behind the Zoggies, the Sondas, the Pintos, the Dr. Noras, like all of the providers that have made uh, Breathe Institute what it is today. Yeah. And I love that about you, Lily. You really integrate everybody and then you you really talk so highly about them and you elevate them. And the more they elevate, the more you elevate. It's like this beautiful symbiotic relationship. It's just I appreciate so... That. I do. And I think that's the part that gets challenging as a business owner and leader. And I'm sure many of your uh, following um, or folks tuning in would probably attest to this too, because that's my main mission. But what happens when the business gets busier and you're dealing with the day-to-day -day politics and the diplomacy and the stuff that, that take you away from your people? And this is where I think it's important to assess, like if you have a Jen, you have a Laylee, you have a Rose, like whoever it is that that is serving as that kind of clutch person on your team, making sure to check in with them to see you know, are you okay? What else can I take off your plate now that I've added this, right? Because it's not just about you grow and they continue in that role. So every year our team grows, I meet with Jen and I'm like, what can I take off your plate? And for her, it's like, well, can they do this, right? And do, are you sure you want me to let go of this? But that's the only way she gets sustainable growth as well. So just carving out time when you can to reflect on that and, and the people that are going above and beyond, how do you honor them in your team? Yeah. Right. And that's why it takes people like you, Laylee, who can see that, right? Who can see their zone of genius so you can assist them in helping them grow. So I'm curious, how, what, what advice do you have for a, for a business that's just starting off or that just has like a few team members? How can they scale to where you are at with sure. the kind of be, care that you I give? I would say be resourceful. I think the businesses, especially in healthcare, when you're a newer startup and you want to do things and you want to get all the the, what do you call it, bells and whistles, and you want to, you know, just go out there and already be this large organization, we were very much, uh, very much grassroots and, and bootstraps in the sense of very, like, organically growing Breathe Institute. We had a 900 square foot office that when we initially started out of as we were constructing this suite that we're in now. And um, we outgrew that place probably five months into opening the practice and are still, when folks travel to come see us or shadow Dr. Zoggy, they're expecting like a UCLA health systems, you know, a whole building dedicated to Breathe Institute. But in reality, even before COVID, I believed in a hybrid work model, right? So if right now we can't sign another lease and commit ourselves to a liability in this unsure, uncertain time of COVID, do and make with what you have, right? Like do like, as much as you can with what you have and, and start small, right? Baby steps and have defined roles for people. So if you're just starting out, yes, uh, you know, your front office person can also run back office and float, but how long is that going to be sustainable? And as you grow, when are you ready to make that commitment to bringing somebody else new? But it can't be off the bat just because a traditional office may have X amount of assistance or X amount of, you know, operations people start resourcefully. And then every three months, six months, what have you reassess and see where the needs are and, um, you know, do things organically. And the, the best thing to do is this is something we share in our lectures. People buy people these days. And this in this generation, folks are buying the person behind the product, not the product. Right. So spend more time in showing who you are, what you're offering, as opposed to all the things that maybe what a social media company may be telling you to focus on, you know, your constituents best, you know, your message best and find someone who, who understands your vision and start with that. So start with two critical, one clinical, one operations, or if you're a business outside of healthcare, just have one person who's at least 50% left brain, 50% right brain that can help you with growing the vision of the company. 
It's beautiful. It's really, and one of the first things you said is like change, right? Embrace the change because it's always changing. If you're resisting change, you're in for trouble. It's, it's, it's especially right now. I mean, I give Chad a huge shout out here. We, uh, right when COVID hit, we had about four, um, personal personalized courses, one in Miami, one in Texas, I think two in LA to follow. We had hotel contracts, a lot of financial investment into doing these live courses. And then come, what was it like March, April, and then the closures hit. And then we had to shuffle around and pivot where everybody had that kind of downtime. And so many of my friends were calling me, I'm bored. I'm this Chad and I had like, you know, 14 hour days, um, just banging out, converting all of our in-person course content into an online version of what we had never done online courses, Dr. Zaghi, four, four days of eight hour lectures. We were like, how are we going to keep people engaged? How are we going to make it so anything even sticks, right? So for almost two weeks, him and I completely, and hugely Chad, transformed all of our content into this course platform. We met with Zoggy, we practiced things, and then we got rave reviews. And the beauty of that was now we had the ability to get folks from Europe, from the Middle right. East, Dubai, Iran, they were expressing interest in taking the course and now they had access to it, right? So if you so don't- incredible. Like, and if you're not open to that change and you just sit back and you say, oh my gosh, this sucks, you know, poor me, like we lost so much on this and you just play that victim role as opposed to, all right, pivot. That was the year of like COVID pivot was like the word of TBI over and over again. And luckily we're a family. So when we ask someone to pivot because they believe in the vision and they've seen that we've taken care of them, they didn't come from a place of fear. Of course, the unknown naturally gets you a little bit like, what am I, what's going to happen to my role? But um, they believed in, and we just, we just kept growing. So onward and upward. Thank you, Chad. <laughs> amazing. Amazing change, pivot, take care of your people. I mean, mm -hmm. you're giving so many amazing nuggets to all the listeners. It, this is so incredibly valuable. Thank you. And thank you for caring about those things. And I see you when, even when you were in Boston for the lecture, when we did the, the residency, everybody that spoke up there, you were front row center, such an active listener. And it's when you're in this role of someone who's meant to be in a service role, whatever that is, and you're there to help people, right? How can you help if you're, you're helping in your vision, right? You have to listen to what it is they're asking for, what it is they need, and to be able to personalize and customize your response specifically to that person. And it's cool just seeing the different assessments that you've had, that you've done with different teams, including ours, to understand what each one of our roles is. Like I'm the person who can see the talent and help groom and bring that out of a person, right? Chad is the one who can see the overall what's needed to make all of this feasible. And then we have a team who can generate these ideas and bring them to life. So it's it's so healthy. It's so healthy to not only just hire and train them, but then to stop and audit and ask, where are we at? Who's part of this equation and where are we going? So thank you for the resources you bring. And I'm looking forward to slowing down a little bit in 2023 and, and working more closely with you because again, genuinely, and I know you're, you're here to, to, to ask me questions, but the, 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 the gifts that you have, my dear, have been so, so pivotal, just the smallest little tips because you were able to hear me and not say, don't say you don't have time. Don't say this. How about you try this? And I was like, sure, sure. I can give that a shot. And, and, and it was perfect. It was exactly what I needed. Thank you. Thank you. That's so sweet. <laughs> of course. And I'm, I'm hoping we can find ways to, cause I know you do a lot of one-on-one -on -one, uh, work with folks, but I'm hoping in 2023, especially one of the things we're going to be doing with our Malibu Canyon and Calabasas location is really pivoting it back to what Sonda originally kind of, um, uh, uh, expanded the, the the location and the host of services there to focus more on the other side of healing. Yeah. Right? yeah. And like you, I've had to pivot oh. too, because my schedule has gotten so full that I've had to start more group programs because amazing. I couldn't, I can't be the one person doing so many things. That's right. Amazing. And so, so it's change is the name of the game. When you're an entrepreneur, you have to keep changing, pivoting and opening up. Like you said, service, when service is the center key of whatever you do, then that becomes the focus. And then it's less about you and 
what can you do and can't do and ego doesn't get in the way because there's no space for ego and there's no time for ego you just keep going because people so need you said. so right? beautifully said yeah and that's but what you're doing you're really like what breathe institute has done is like change the the game of healthcare and helping other healthcare providers. I mean, the ripple effects of that. I mean, isn't that incredible? We're and just talking like, about- Right, no, no, please finish. I'd love to hear what you had to say. To no, me. all I was saying was it takes, we're just talking about Dr. Rathi, but there's so many like Dr. Rathi around, like who are doing right. the work that you're doing. So it's beautiful. And it takes um, this element of getting out of a fear mentality, right? Because Dr. Zoggy will go up and say things that are not conventional in an ENT sleep surgeon's world. When he's invited to speak for other groups and organizations, it's not the same following and or acceptance because it's not what was in the medical books when they went to school or they did their fellowship. But he came out out of Harvard, Stanford, UCLA and fellowship trained sleep surgery at Stanford and was still open to saying, I don't know at all. And things change. The book of medicine is not closed. It's not done being printed and published. And, and in fact, as I was listening to you just now, one thing that we are all missing in healthcare is we have the standard intakes. We have the same questions we ask about surgical history, past medical history. We ask about HIPAA compliance. And can I share this information with anyone else? But we don't do a good enough job at the, let me get to know you profile right? Then let me get to truly know you profile. And I know we did this with Dr. Norris and Breathe Babies uh, and Kids for the dental department. We, her and I worked on customizing the intake so that it's like, tell me a little bit more about your child. Do they have a nickname or they're, you know, can we offer J-U-I-C-E to Jen's point to your, you know, just so we know each family and we can really customize care when they come in, but why not do that on a larger scale with adults? And why not do that across all health offices. And again, as I, you know, every time I talk to someone like you or Christian Gonzalez or Cassandra Carlopio, I'm like, we need this in our intake process as well. We genuinely do. Yeah. And you said a few things was making notes as you were talking, the, the humbleness of the providers like Dr. Zaghi, right? Like he's this, this such humbleness to him and him having also met him, like he's so, so down to earth and so, so relatable and also the the courage to speak being unconventional is not an easy job in the field of medical in the medical profession because there's so much ego involved there 100%. so people are not ready for and all, so much of the material is outdated right and it, and doctors are healers and they forget that they're healers and dr zagi is really pivoting the way um, to show that it's like, you know, breaking the, the, the rules, if you speak. Absolutely. It's revolutionizing care. And it's really that Nietzsche quote, that whole, those who've seen dancing were seen, what was it? Or thought it was as crazy by those who can hear the music, right? Just because you may not know. Um, and it, it's, it's too much of this abstract concept. Dr. Zaghi and Sonda did collaborate in that office that I told you they did 50 cases together and then they stopped. Wait, we're onto something. People are getting better. Suturing makes a difference. Doing therapy this way makes a difference. Addressing compensations makes a difference. And that was where I was on a high. I felt like I was back in school getting what I thought I was going to go to UCLA and get this whole dental, like dental medical education, both really, because dental is a huge part of medicine. Um, it's the portal to health. It really genuinely is. But I get it day in and day out in the clinic. We're more of like a research institute. So they'll come up with a concept and then they'll be able to test it. We're doing that right now with uh, Light Scalpel. It's a phenomenal kind of uh, part educational partner we have. Uh, they've come up with a new handpiece laser wise and Dr. Zoggy gets it and he gets to test it. And we are able to provide care for free for patients who want to, 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 you know, to try it out. And then we see benefits and they're getting better. And now we're saving patients money and kids may not have to go through anesthesia and go under uh, general, you know, anesthesia and surgery to get their tonsils taken out if they're candidates, like think about that. And the only way we evolve and improve these modalities. And this is something Dr. Zoggy talks about in his lecture. If we don't stay open in airway medicine, we'd still be doing tracheostomy for every airway sleep apnea patient, right? We, and then, you know, you get CPAP and CPAP is phenomenal. So gold standard of care, but what do you do with patients who can't comply with, with the mask and the CPAP? Now we have 
ways of addressing whether or not they're tongue tied or it's just a tongue tone issue and functions a factor and just getting the tongue up and functioning properly can, uh, you know, prevent that obstruction from happening. So yes, it definitely takes, you know, a visionary who's open to exploring. It takes a team uh, that can contribute their perspectives. And then um, it takes getting out of this fear mindset of change comes with work. If you're not in it, and you're, you're afraid of the work you shouldn't be doing healthcare period, like go work in a, you know, in a setting where you can just clock in and clock out. But whenever you're in private practice, whenever you bring anything that's outside of the norm and, and the, the, the people want it, the masses want it. Now you've taken on this responsibility, right. And, and this oath that I think everyone who went into healthcare in the first place needs to remember, which is first do no harm. Right. If you know right. better, you need to do better. And you can't just say, I took this course, but I don't have time to implement it. Let me just put it in the back burner. You need to, to be ready to, to not just consume this information. We have this patient who's phenomenal. He's like, we're all such consumers. We're consuming, consuming. I consuming. know. Actually, right. Right. Yes. Bring your gifts into the world. And that comes with being in silence and being in words and like knowing yourself and coming back full circle and, and fear. I, I love that you brought up fear because fear is ego. If you let go of fear, then so many doors open up because then it's more like, okay, what is the next step I need to take? What's the next step? What's the next step? And there is no room for turning back. We've moved so far away from understanding these main psychological principles. And I feel like psychology, just like dentistry became like this field that was so separated from traditional healthcare to the point where we have a shortage of primary care physicians, right? I say this in our lectures too. We have uh, organizations like one, for, like one Medical Forward popping up left and right because we don't have enough primary care physicians. We have all these specialists but no one person is looking at the patient as a whole. I mean, we obviously have practitioners who do that, but there's a shortage of them. So this is where, if you really think about the role of anybody who's in the field of psychology, cognitive health and well-being, anyone who is talking about the portal, right? We talk, chew, swallow how many times a day? And we think our dentists are just ah, someone who's out to make some money. That's not true. I really encourage every listener to think about your dentist in a different light. They spend more money on continuing education than any healthcare professional I have ever seen. And I've been in every field in terms of healthcare. What medical professionals spend on continuing education is a fraction. It's like pennies on the dollar compared to what your oral health professionals spend to bring the latest tools and technology. But keep in mind that it's more than just restoring a tooth, putting a crown, fixing a cavity. True healthcare as it yeah. pertains to dentistry is this is the portal to your like periodontal health, your uh, you know, your 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 cognitive health and well-being and your breathing, your breathing. It's it's the nose, but your mouth plays a major part in this. So uh, I would ask anybody who's listening or anyone who's out there to to ask if you have a provider or a dentist who is not bringing up these things to you, ask if they do assess for sleep disordered breathing, what they're providing outside of just traditional dental cleanings. Or if you come into an office like Dr. Honda's and you're like, why is she asking me these things? Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Cause she's going above and beyond making sure that she just doesn't fix the tooth that any past, you know, tension, trauma, anything that you've held and retained there, all of it has come into surface and being resolved. That's true healing and someone who's invested that much in saying, you know what, I have to take my expert hat off, my expert dentist, my expert airway hat off when I have a patient and really explain things to them in terms that resonate with them. That's the biggest thing. Any doctor or any leader, whatever your industry is, is just being able to take off your, you know, CEO executive title and just be on the same level, just listen and be relatable. And I think that's the other thing in addition to change and, and building your team um, is just being present for the folks you're serving. Oh, it's beautiful. Thank you, Laili. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your beautiful knowledge. How can people find you yeah. and what are ways that they can work with you? Tell us more. Absolutely. Well, in terms of um, anybody looking for, if you you or your child um, has any difficult breathing, speaking, um, you know, what have you, if you feel like you're tongue-tied, if you feel like you can't effectively breathe through your nose, 
Um, we are the Breathe Institute, and you can find us at thebreatheinstitute.com. Uh, we do have affiliates in probably over 30 states right now. And um, so we are huge advocates for training and bringing these protocols, not only across the US, but we have affiliates in UK and in um, Canada as well. So we wanna bring these services internationally and nationally to everyone who is seeking uh, more information. So breatheinstitute.com. And um, you know, in terms of the leadership stuff, if you ever attend a Breathe Institute course and want to learn how to successfully implement the stuff, I do, as, um, as you shared, Padma, I do share some of the stuff, but we're also looking forward to hopefully soon hosting uh, more of these in-person events and hopefully flying you out uh, to come join and lead an activity for all the doctors in attendance, because that's something that we definitely want to grow more um, for our ambassadors and our base. But yeah, and you can always call us for anyone who's interested, 310-579-9710 uh, to ask more about any health-related questions. But thank you so much. What an honor. What a gift. Um, when you asked me, I was like, me? But thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the work that you do. It's had such a profound effect on me um, daily. And I'm really looking forward to, to finding more time to working closely with you individually and for our whole team as well. Thank you so much, Lely. Such a, such a pleasure. And I'll put everything in the show notes as well. Thank you. Pleasure seeing you. Happy New Year to everyone and looking forward to all the magic this year has in store for all. Thank you, Lely. Thank you. Have a good one.